like to uh, move into no the second seven. part of our national conversation right now. And we are absolutely thrilled to have um, such a wonderful panel that will be guiding us through uh, the Encuentro. Um, and so uh, we would you know, really like to welcome them and, and, and give them the floor. So we have um, Father Capo with us, uh, Gabriela Karaszewski, um, Nick Stein, and Darius Villalobos with us. So they will be um, guiding us through um, what happened at Encuentro and what's happening going forward. So we welcome them and thank them. All right, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, let, us, let us begin with prayer so that in the presence of the Lord we can do this in, in, in the spirit that we did it at the National Encuentro. And let us begin with the prayer that uh, the bishops issued for the National Encuentro. And we're going to do this uh, alternating in English and Spanish. All right, so we're gonna do one. This first slide is going to be in English and then the next one in Spanish so you guys can practice with us, all right? And I'm gonna test, test you guys. En el nombre del Padre, del Hijo, y del Espíritu Santo, amen. God of infinite mercy, you sent your risen son to encounter the disciples on the way to Emmaus. Grant us today a missionary spirit and send us forth to encounter our brothers and sisters. A caminar junto a ellos en amistad, a escuchar sus tristezas y alegrías con compasión y proclamar tu palabra con valentía para que puedan reconocerte de nuevo en la fracción del pan. Make us all missionary disciples and stay with us always as we seek to share the joy of the gospel with people of all generations from every race, language, culture, and nation. Te lo pedimos desde nuestros corazones ardientes llenos del Espíritu Santo en nombre de nuestro Señor Jesucristo y por la amorosa intercesión de nuestra Santa Madre María de Guadalupe, estrella de la nueva evangelización en las Américas. Amén. All right. So, uh, we're going to have this conversation to share on what is one of the most important initiatives that the U.S. Catholic bishops uh, have undertaken in, in the last decades. Uh, it's been a, a long process, it is still a process, that has brought much life and hope to the church, especially in the middle uh, of the times that we're living, and uh, brings much hope to youth and young adult ministry uh, for the church in the United States. And we have, I have my colleagues here, I have Gabriela Karashevsky, she's the director of young adult and campus ministry for the Archdiocese of Galveston, Houston. She's, a, she's also a member of the National Advisory Team for Young Adult Ministry. She's originally from Mexico, but I don't know, with that Polish last name. <laughs> no, uh, she married a, a Polish man, and they have two daughters, right? Yes. Okay, we also have Nicholas, uh, Nicholas Stein. He's the program manager for the Bon Secure Young Adult Ministry, and he's the chairperson, we all know, of uh, the USCCB National Advisory Team on Young Adult Ministry. He's, you're originally from Seattle, right? And he's married to Samantha, and you have three children. And we have Darius Villalobos. He's the newly appointed Director of Multicultural Ministry for uh, NFCYM. He's uh, also a member of the National Advisory Team for Young Adult Ministry. And he's originally from Chicago, but from a Puerto Rican family, right? And he's married to, uh, to Lisette, and they have a tortoise, right? <laughs> he, that's what he, he told me. <laughs> okay, I don't have any tortoise or children. I better not. I'm Father Rafael Capo. <laughs> yeah, I'm originally from Puerto Rico, and uh, I'm a priest of the Archdiocese of Miami, director 
at the U.S. Catholic Bishops Southeast Regional Office and Pastoral Institute for Hispanic Ministry, CEPI. Uh, I'm advisor to uh, La Red of Pastoral Juvenil and uh, a proud missionary of mercy uh, appointed by Pope Francis. So we're going to be leading the conversation today and we're going to begin by uh, setting the framework. What is the Fifth National Encuentro? Many of you have heard, many of you participated. Uh, those of you that participated, could you please raise your hands? In any way, yes, many of you. <laughs> and you know that the fifth national encuentro of Hispanic Latino ministry uh, has been a very important process that has roots that go back to Vatican II. Uh, Latin American bishops started a process of encuentro, of consultation, of pastoral planning trying to implement a council, listening to the people with a see, judge, act methodology. And the influence of that pastoral theology arrived here in the United States with immigrant priests, with bishops that were visiting, with pastoral leaders that arrived from Latin America, and they started influencing the way that U.S. Hispanic ministry was born. Uh, then they began doing the same here in the States with a consultation process that they called the Encuentros. And they go back to the 70s. And out of each process of Encuentro that we've had in the 70s, the 80s, uh, they listened to the grassroots, they discerned, and they came up with a, a pastoral plan and a spirituality of doing ministry with, uh, with our people. Back then, it was more uh, consulting and arriving at conclusions on how to better serve Hispanic Latinos in the United States. But with the influence of St. John Paul II's uh, new evangelization, and then with the last conference of Latin American bishops in Aparecida, the spirituality of missionary discipleship started uh, setting a new ground for Hispanic ministry in the United States before Pope Francis and before uh, the mainstream church in the United States started using the term missionary discipleship. So we came uh, to the moment where we started thinking we need to engage our young Hispanics in a deeper way. And in 2006, La Red, uh, the National Catholic Network of Pastoral Juvenil, together with the bishops, convened the first national encuentro of Pastoral Juvenil, which engaged young people, young Latinos, from the parish level, the diocesan, the regions, up to that national moment. After that, we had some years waiting for something to brew at the national level for Hispanic ministry. And while we were talking about missionary discipleship and Pope Francis became Pope, it was the opportune moment as the numbers of Hispanic Latinos were growing in the nation to realize that it was the moment not just to think how to better serve Hispanic Latinos, but how to have Hispanic Latinos, young Hispanics, which were becoming not just a big number, but a majority within the Catholic Church in the United States. How can we have them be leaders for the church? How can we empower them? So the bishops convened a new encuentro they can be in a, an encuentro process that began at the grassroots level with uh, three years ago with consultations, with a missionary activity at the parish level going out to the peripheries, having conversations, and a parish encuentro where they put together all those conversations. Then they took the, all the conversations, sending delegates, to the diocesan level at diocesan encuentros the next year. 
the bishops heard the voices of their delegates and sent them forth to regional encuentros in 2017. And those uh, diocesan delegates finally arrived at the national encuentro that we just had in Texas in September. We gathered 4,000 delegates from around the nation at a moment of grace, of much hope, with a very special message from Pope Francis. And we discern there, following the methodology of See, Judge, Act. Now that we uh, receive the conclusions of that uh, national encuentro, we look forward to the continuation, because it's not an event. Now we will begin the implementation phase of the encuentro process. Going down again, after going to the national level, now we'll go down to the regions, to the dioceses, and to the parishes to empower especially our young Latinos. So that has been the process of the encuentros. But I would like to, uh, to have my colleagues here also share what they have. Gabriela, if you could uh, please share some, some uh, insights and findings from the encuentro process that will be useful for us uh, in young adult ministry, uh, if you could share something with us. Thank you, Father. So I brought my magazine to show and tell. <laughs> this little booklet you're seeing here is exactly the process. That was five sessions that a lot of Catholics in the pews did back three years ago. It's five steps that take you into going out of the parish, going out of your house, and literally listen to others and have an encounter with them. So when you read along this, the process at the parish level, when you read that booklet, it just totally reminds you of what is written all over the place, what is written in Evangelii Gaudium, what is written on the preparatory uh, document of the Synod, what was talked about in the Synod. And those are the basic concepts of evangelization that we as young adult ministers already know. We don't do young adult ministry without listening. We need to listen to our young adults. Number two, we don't do it just in large groups. We do small groups or one-to-one -one accompaniment. However, those two key concepts of our evangelization approach, how can they be possible if me as a minister, I don't speak the language of the young adult I'm serving? How can I listen to his needs if we don't speak the same language? How can I accompany someone who comes from a different culture, especially Hispanic culture, right? So that's when the third term comes very handy, which is a term of encounter. The theology of encounter for me has been an answer to this problem of not speaking the language or not knowing the, the culture of our young adults because for me personally encounter is to go out and listen to them where they're at. I recently had the blessing to go to Africa two months ago and I was in Bidi Bidi refugee camp and I had to listen to the stories of the South Sudanese people who were refugees there, two million of them. And I had to answer them something and something that came to my mind was the spirituality of communion from John Paul II. If you go back to 2000, John Paul wrote a beautiful letter to his diocese. And it was all about spirituality of communion. And there's a paragraph, paragraph 43, that says, your joys are my joys, your sadnesses are my sadnesses. And that's really what it is to be a one body of Christ, to really believe that our fellow Hispanic brothers and sisters who are in young adult ministry truly belong to one body of Christ. Um, and to see them that all those gifts that they have are a gift for me. So here's what I'm gonna go quickly through three slides of what not I say, what not bishops say, but what the thousands of people who were part of the process and went out of their comfort zone to listen to others, what they discovered today in 2018. Um, if we go back to the graph, sorry. <laughs> so there has been five encuentros, but back in the 1960s, Hispanic population was only 10%. Now we're talking about 40% of the Catholic population are Hispanic. If you look at people under the age of 30, there are 55% of them. If you look under the age of 18, it's 60% of them. We're not just the low hanging fruit in our ministry. Yes, we're numerous, we're many, but already one fourth left the church. That's a brand new statistic for you. 25% of Latinos are nuns. 
So we also need to do something about that. Here are the needs that young adults are talking to us about. Number one, Hispanic young adults, these are no needs, these are realities too. Hispanic young adults are full of joy, gifts, talents, skills, strength, creativity, potential, and the list can go on. If any of you have visited a pastoral juvenile group, I, at least myself, I come out of there with more energy than when I walk in. They have a lot of gifts. They have the gift to know what is tradition. They have the gift to know what is community. And many of them, because they don't have their family in this country, they develop these sisterhood, brotherhood uh, links that I haven't seen before. In our table, we're just talking about, they really live what is accompaniment, accompaniment of one person to the other. Number two, Hispanic young adults are gente puente. They're bridge people. They're no longer the immigrants. Only 10% of all our Hispanic people in the United States are newly immigrants. 90% is made up of all those who are born here, who are called second generation and third generation. So they're bicultural, they're bilingual, and most of them are American. They were born and raised in the school system of America. However, their parents took them to Spanish masses. Their parents taught them to pray with Our Lady of Guadalupe. They eat different food than the mainstream American church does. So uh, here, Darius is gonna tell us how to have best practices to deal with this reality. But if we find one of the best practices is find your gente puente in your parish. Find your gente puente in your diocese. If you don't speak the language, they do and they understand pretty well what the needs of the other side are. Also, we're giving you a beautiful book that will help you, newly written and published, with this reality. So the next uh, reality is that Hispanic young adults are at the peripheries. You tell me if you don't think that young adult ministry in general is in the periphery, in a parish. <laughs> young adults in tra transitions many times find themselves in the peripheries of a parish. Well, imagine how Hispanic young adults feel. 60% of them um, graduate from college. Only 16% of them graduate from college. Many of them drop from high school. So they are not participating in our English youth ministry programs. They're not going to college. Where are they? They're sitting in our pews. I know they are there. Um, many of them not many of them, sorry, but there is a large percentage of gangs, there is a large percentage of addictions, which is not only for that culture, but it goes across lines. Addictions exist everywhere. However, among Hispanics, they are a little bit higher. The other statistic I have is 41% of the Hispanic children are being raised by a single mother right now. So, yes, uh, we can talk in, in the tables when we're having dialogues as well, that reality goes across the line, Yes, but for some reason, Hispanics are always a little bit higher in those percentages. So they are at the peripheries. And let's not forget many of them haven't fixed their, their documents, they're undocumented, and you should see the amount of stress that my Hispanic young adults are going through right now. It's huge. We're actually giving them a lot of mental health sessions, not just the spiritual and retreats, but mental health um, to release their stress a little bit on that. They're begging to be recognized, welcomed, and engaged in the parish community. So, Hispanic young adults are currently doing great in Pastoral Juvenil. I, I cannot stop and acknowledge that Pastoral Juvenil has existed in this country for many, many years. Organizations like La Red, like CEPI, Fe Vida, have done an outstanding job of forming uh, young adult Hispanic ministers, and yet they're not enough. Those attempts haven't been enough for the reality that's ahead of us in the Catholic Church in the United States. They're begging to be welcome. Most of the conversations that we hear at the national level on the tables and at the regional level is, we just simply want a priest, we just simply want a minister who is intercultural competent, who speaks our culture, not so much our language. So, pastoral juvenil is booming, it is, but it is under-resourced. It's just a reality. I am blessed to have in my diocese 30 young adult groups in English, about 30 or 40 in Spanish. Uh, but the reality is that when you visit parishes, it doesn't, they don't have the same budgets. We have five paid young adult ministers in parishes, zero in Spanish. Everything is run through volunteers. So, um, last slide, last reality. 
Again, this is not Gabriela talking. This is the result of 14 regions that are written in a booklet. I invite you to look at the FIFA Encuentro website. These summaries are there. So the last reality is the majority of the evangelization and faith formation programs and conferences right now in our nation are offered only in English. So only 9% of our lay ministers nationwide are Hispanic. Therefore, we need a lot more formation resources, retreats, conferences, worships, you name it. They're asking for that in their parish, they're asking for that in regions, they're asking that nationwide. And not only that they are translated into Spanish, but they would like it to be within their cultural context. Um, number two, human resources. They're needing much more human resources. Again, not just run by a volunteer leader who has already two full-time jobs. Most of my young adults are already full-time students and they work part-time and on top of that, they are the leaders of the group, which amazes me. So if only 9% of the lay leaders in the United States are Hispanic, then we need much more human resources who are either intercultural competent or, um, or, that can, or that can help out find the gente puente, right? And the last thing is financial resources. I guess it all goes back a, a lot of times in diocese of, well, there is nothing in the budget, right? How can I add another person in my team? There is not money. But I guess it is our duty to go and speak and advocate on their behalf so we can invest in the largest growing population of the United States in America. So now those are the realities, that's the C. Now I hand it over to Nick for the judging. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no pressure, right? Yeah, good. Um, I'll let, uh, you all got this book, right? You all have this book in front of you? Um, open up to page Three. And I'll read along. We're going to read those first two paragraphs. Not long ago, this is from Hoffman of Spino, a professor at Boston College, who's the editor of this book. I learned about two high ranking ordained Catholic pastoral leaders in the southwest of the United States talking about the future of their dioceses. One of them expressed concern at the declining number of Catholics in the di diocese he served and the low levels of participation in parish life among Catholic youth. His conversation partner replied, I paraphrase, I thought that your diocese was doing better since the number of Hispanic Catholics has practically doubled, perhaps tripled, since the year 2000. To this, the response was, well, if you count Hispanics, then it's a different story. This anecdote captures well one of the major challenges that Catholics face in the United States, to embrace the fact that we are a church with many cultural families and that the majority of young Catholics in the country are Hispanic. Hispanic Catholics are not a different story. All Catholics in the United States, Asian, Black, Hispanic, Native American, white, are part of the same story the story of the baptized women and men who live our relationship with Jesus Christ within the Roman Catholic tradition. Unless we understand this and its implications, we will not be able to embrace our present realidad, much less appreciate this book. It's not about the book, but it is about the reality. It's not a different story. It's not a different story. And I say that as very much aware that I'm the white guy up here, right? <laughs> Who, while I understand a lot of Spanish, definitely don't speak it, right? Um, it's not a different story. And that was what was brought home to me so clearly at the National Encuentro event uh, in Texas. Um, it was a great honor. It was probably the greatest honor of my ministerial life um, to be at that event um, and to be one of just, you know, unfortunately a very few people who look like me who were there and got to experience the whole thing. Um, to see what happened and the joy that was in that room and how young adults were at the center of everything that happened in Texas. Um, they were at the center of everything that happened in Texas. Um, and it was an incredible experience as someone who 
loves young adult ministry and loves working with young people, um, to see that that's where it really crystallized and came alive. And so you have to go back to the working document that formed that event. And it uses the uh, model that we're doing here of see, judge, act. But that working document has such incredible um, uh, statistics, incredible information for everybody here in this room. And you can find it online. It's right there, it's online. Download it as a PDF. Um, there's two things to look for in that document. One is to look for your regional um, description, your regional report. All of us here, um, whether we know it or not, and a lot of you probably don't know which Episcopal, which of the 14 Episcopal regions you belong to, uh, but you'll be able to figure it out pretty easily. It walks you through that. Just pick your state and find which, you know, where on the map you go. Uh, find your regional report, because every region has one and the information is tailored to that region. Uh, and then in the middle of the, that book, that working document, is a whole bunch of statistics, and they are so important. Um, I'm not a numbers person. That's not the way my brain works, but the numbers are so overwhelmingly important. You have to just go and dive in and see what you can find there. So when I look at my region, right, I'm from Baltimore, and so I'm part of region four, which is basically Maryland and Virginia and Delaware in West Virginia. Um, in our region, the number of Hispanics in our region has doubled in the last 18 years. So from the year 2000, in our region, the number of Hispanics has doubled. But has the church doubled in its ministry efforts? No, in most areas we've shrunk, but we have, and most of those Hispanics who've come to our region or have moved to our region are Catholic, and yet we've not been growing in our ministry efforts. That's a judgment, right? And there's something wrong with that. There's also something wrong with the fact that there are, in our region, there are 40% of the Catholics under the age of 18 um, are Hispanic, yet only six to seven percent of our Catholic school students are Hispanic. 40% of the Catholics are Hispanic under the age of 18, yet only six to 7% of our Catholic school students are Hispanic. That's a judgment. There's something wrong with the numbers. And this is, region four is a pretty easy region um, for this stuff. It's worse in other regions and it's better in some regions, but know what's going on in your region. You have to know what the numbers are because that points out the structural realities. And that's what this comes down to, right? It comes down to the fact that we have to know what those structural realities and the structural problems and issues uh, that we're facing in our diocese are. And we have to be willing to make those judgments. We have to be able to interpret that data to point out we're doing something wrong, right? You said that I mean, I remember the number being 6%. 9% sounds better for lay pastoral ministers. But 9%, mm -hmm. there's something wrong. Um, and so I s get to sit here and make some judgments. But I'm going to say that it's, it's wrong. There's something wrong about what's going on and how our church is structured when it comes to this ministry and it comes to serving our brothers and sisters because it's not a different story. It's the same story, but the resources are not going where they need to go. Um, so I'm gonna leave it there and turn it over to Darius who does have um, some hope for us in terms of how we act on this. Thank you, Nick. Um, my job for this particular panel was to talk about the acting, not do out. How do we put this into practice in our own realities, whatever that context is, whatever that ministry is that you serve. Um, so I wanted to start with just some of the practical ministry um, examples that you can use for those who work directly with or are wanting to work directly with Hispanic Latino young adults. First, we need to understand who they are. Whoever those young people are in our context, it's diverse and it's different. 
My family was all, all my grandparents were born in Puerto Rico. When my grandparents came here, they had a very different experience of being migrants than others. They were not immigrants, they were US citizens. They were not treated like US citizens. That very much shaped the way that they understood their own lived experience as people in Chicago at a time that racial tension was very high. That also shaped the way that my father was raised. He was not allowed to speak Spanish at home because my grandfather was afraid that if they had an accent, they would be treated differently or they would not be given the same opportunities that others would have. And so I've actually learned more Spanish than my father has, particularly because of the work I do in pastoral ministry. That was a tool that I realized I needed to do to serve my community well. So that diversity of experience is something that we have to enter into and really acknowledge. And it's not just about what country they're from, the difference in realities between first generation, second, third generation. We also have the reality of the professions. Are they students? Are they going into the professional world? Are they laborers? There's so much diversity in that context. Language, English, Spanish, both. Spanglish, somewhere in between. Those are realities that many of our young people are living into. And we need to acknowledge what those are first before we can really understand how do we enter into that moment of encounter to understand their needs? So first, ask the question, who are they? And the only way you get to really understand who someone is, is by listening. Taking the time to create space so that we can have that encounter, because it's one thing to assume what we think their needs are. It's a very different process to listen and to talk with and to understand those needs from a very real place. You might be really surprised. You know, one of the things that came through very clearly for many of the young adults who are at the National Encuentro, they're asking for formation. And not just formation, they want the level of formation that our seminarians are receiving, that our brothers and sisters are getting as they're entering into religious life. They have a desire and a hunger to know so much more about their faith, but not just to know their faith, but to be able to live it and share it in their work communities, in their parishes, in their neighborhoods. It's so much deeper than sometimes we think. And we don't know what we don't know. And the only way we can do that is by asking. So the importance of dialogue, I think, is really important. Um, and I think it's really important to recognize that particularly in the Latino community, um, there's a real understanding when it comes to pastoral ministry. It's not a ministry that you can do for someone. It's a ministry that you have to do with. And so the invitation to involvement, engagement, and to leadership is so important. If you are serious about reaching out to Latino young adults, you need to listen to them, and then you need to find a way to say, how can we do this together? How can we find a common project that we can invest in together, not just for them or their peers, but for our entire community of Catholics, of young adults, in our parishes, in our dioceses? The desire to give is more than just to themselves. It's greater than that. And that was very, very clear at the Quinto Encuentro. I would say last, something to keep in mind is that we have an opportunity right now through the National Dialogue, which we'll talk a little bit more uh, later on today, to really engage in these kind of conversations of encounter and to really listen to what those needs are, to what those realities are, and to then be able to understand how do we respond as pastoral ministers in our specific context. So whether you work at a parish or at a diocese or in an organization, the number one thing I can ask you to do to act on, and I know it seems passive, but it's to listen, to have the space to dialogue. And then once you've listened, to work with those that you've listened to, to find out where do we go from here? What do we need to do next? As Father Capote changed to the next slide, I think something too is that we have to really expand our pastoral toolbox because this is not something that we can do by ourselves and we don't have to. We're not building something from scratch. Uh, as Father Capo said, there's a history of ministry with Hispanics, Latinos in this country and there's also a lot of resources that we just don't even know are there that we need to make ourselves familiar with. First, as, uh, as Nick said, find your region report. It will give you a snapshot of what 
the Hispanic Latino community looks like in your area. And it will also give you some, some very concrete things, some examples of starting points for those potential conversations and for that, that pastoral practice that we need to do. So all of it's available online. You can still go to the Encuentro website, which I put up there, and you will find all of those resources. You'll find the manual. You'll find the region breakdown if you're not sure what region you're in. Um, and all of that information is available bilingually. And I say that because it's so important, and particularly for this Encuentro. Again, this was not an Encuentro focused on what can we do to serve the Latino community. It was an Encuentro of how can the Hispanic Latino community serve the larger church. It's an important distinction to make. Secondly, talk to your local leadership from the Latino community and find out what are they doing and how you might be able to work together. If you work in a parish, talk to your diocesan leaders. If they have an office for Hispanic ministry or an Hispanic outreach, find out what they're doing for Hispanic young people and see if there's ways to collaborate. If you work at a diocese, this is an opportunity to reach across the aisle to some of your colleagues that sometimes we're not very good at talking with or collaborating with. This is a really important moment to do that. I know in some dioceses that these conversations have been going on and literally the youth or young adult person just found out about the Quinto Encuentro two weeks before the September gathering. And they're like, wait, did you need me at that event? Did you expect me to be at that? And it does take both sides. We both are culpable when we don't see that kind of collaboration happening. Extend the olive branch. Take the time to have the conversation. Recognize, too, that there are lots of other resources outside of your diocese, outside of your own structures that are available to you. Um, one of the most important resources that uh, we have here available to us as a national organization is La Red. Um, I want to just thank a couple of our colleagues who are here. Uh, Father Capo, who is one of the uh, assessadores with the group, uh, but also Juan Pablo Padilla and Norma Velez Garcia is here. Uh, they are on the board of La Red and were gracious enough to, to join us to be a resource to you in your pastoral ministry. And as a network, they're not focused on just serving dioceses. They work with people in the field, with parishioners. They had their annual membership meeting a couple of weeks ago in Chicago, much colder than Tampa. And what I saw there were so many young adults themselves who were already leaders, who are already at the forefront of doing this outreach and work. But I feel many times there is that disconnect that people don't even know they're there. So if you get a chance to have a conversation with them, learn more about La Red, learn more about CEPI. 40 years as an institute by the US Bishops Conference. For just a quick show of hands, how many of you this is the first time of hearing about CEPI? Raise your hands. They've been doing amazing work, and sadly, so many people don't recognize that it's there. Institutes like Fe Vida, which is in Region 7. There's so many resources out there. You don't have to look hard to find them, and if you need help finding them, don't be afraid to ask. Finally, this is true with our ministry with the Latino Hispanic community, but I think this is true for us as just ministers as a whole. We need to grow in our competency working interculturally. We need to grow in our ability to serve those of different communities and different cultures. And the bishops recognized this years ago and invested a lot of time and money into building a guide, building intercultural competency for ministers. There's a workbook. There are trainings available. There are train the trainers. If you're at a diocesan level and you're looking to bring this to your diocese, use it. We all are called as missionary disciples to encounter the other, to go outside of our comfort zones. But the only way that we can truly do that is if we're able to reflect and encounter who we are and who God made us to be, and then be able to see God in the other. And so in whatever you do, whether that's formation through a program like Beckham or through the formation programs that are offered through universities or institutes, we need to grow our capacity to serve and minister with people who are different than ourselves. A lot of that starts from the ability to listen, but a lot of that comes from recognizing who am I so that I can better understand who do I need to be, who am I being called to be in service to others. So with that, I'm going to end the acting part.
um, and just sort of leave it up to what's next. Perfect. Thank you, Darius, and thank you, Nick and Gabriela. Now we would like you to uh, have a conversation in your tables. We have three questions that we would like you to reflect on. So we're going to have uh, ten. ten minutes for you to have a conversation on these questions. Godspeed. Okay, thank you. Hopefully you were able to have a conversation, if not on all three questions, but part of those. And all right, so we are going to have some minutes now for questions to the panel. And we would like to begin with a question. Perhaps, do we have, Father Frank, do we have any questions from the online community following us? They're having a lot of conversation. They don't necessarily have questions. Okay. All right, they're, okay. They're, they're, you've certainly engendered a lot of conversation off of the questions that you have, and particularly about uh, some of the personal, uh, the personal aspects and, and what am I doing personally, which I think is a very uh, evocative question and a good one because it's not just simply what one is doing professionally. Perfect, thank you, Father. Uh, do we have any questions for the panel? Oh, yes. How you doing? Uh, my name is G, everyone. I'm with the Salesians. I have a question. Um, we have a program called Gospel Roads. Last year, we, uh, we did Gospel Roads Mexico. It's an immersion experience where young adults go for a week, end up serving, you know, whatever needs are there. But it's the first time I've ever encountered in ministry resistance from parents. So we had a lot of uh, folks from the South. I don't want my kids going there. I don't want them helping those kinds of people. And I didn't really know how to react to that. You know, me being naive, I'm like, oh, yeah, we're doing Christ's work, right? Yeah, I, I just, I, I didn't know what to really say there because that wasn't really, you know, my, my expertise there. So I guess my question is, in, in those moments, well, I mean, we're also putting the young person in kind of a, a tough place, right? Like they're in the middle. You know, their parents saying one thing, we're saying another. And, and, how do we accompany that? So I guess my question is, how do we accompany that young person to handle those moments where it's not necessarily picking one over the other, but you know, having that respect for what they're doing? Does that make sense? I say it's not me. I, I was reflecting over your comment of we're putting the person between the parents or us. I think it's a new third. Uh, we're talking ourselves during the break about the reality of second and third generation Hispanics. How so far the last 20, 30, 40 years, Pastoral Juvenil Hispana has served first generation immigrants. And English youth and young adult ministry have been serving mainstream English speaking youth and young adults. And now the majority that we're talking about as far as Catholics, second and third generation who doesn't feel fully welcome or that they belong in Pastoral Juvenil or fully welcome and that they belong in English young adult and youth ministry. So I think the spirit, I think the knowledge of Ivan Cuentro, uh, the synod, is all taking us into a third new reality that we need to live in. And it's how we, both sides, can be open to welcome this new reality. It's not just choose them or me. <laughs> it's a new, a new church. So any more comments about that? Because we're talking about that in, in the break. Yeah, I think one of the challenges with any ministry with young people, but particularly your, I'm assuming kind of high school age or you're younger, <laughs> young adults, um, this is also a moment where we have to look at how are we providing opportunities of encounter for these parents? Um, and maybe that needs to be more localized. They, they may not be open to having that experience of going abroad and experiencing that. So maybe creating something for those parents to be able to have an experience locally of that different reality of that different culture, um, oftentimes it's those encounters that open up opportunities for conversion of heart. Um, but it goes back to this idea, this is not us and them, this is all us. Mm -hmm. And so when we, we have those feelings or we have those concerns, 
um, as, as Catholics, what we're really doing is just hurting our own body, not recognizing that the wound is, is self-inflicted. A lot of the statistics that we're talking about, a lot of the leaving of the church, um, as much as we, we have concerns about society, I often feel more concerned about what we're doing to ourselves through our attitudes, through our judgments, through the ways that we see the other as other and not my brother and sister, not Christ in front of me, before me. So if you can find ways to create those encounter moments for those parents, that might be a better way to help move the whole family along in that conversion, not just that young person. Another question. Hi, Father Blair from St. Augustine Diocese. I'm just curious with the um, Protestant or non-denominational evangelical efforts being so successful in Latin American countries and in this country, what are they, other than being really good with presenting the gospel, what are they doing differently that is so amazingly fruitful in the Hispanic community? I'll, gi I'll give you an answer. Funding, resources, they're doing that. They're putting money behind ministries for Hispanic Latinos. They're doing that while we're not. And I'd say the other piece is that we often forget in the formation piece um, is the human formation piece, right? So we're, in the Catholic Church, we've been very, we've been so focused on the spiritual formation or the intellectual formation, but we forget that we also need to meet basic human needs. And we do that often through our Catholic charities, but that doesn't translate into the parish often. And so it's that we are meeting a lot of those needs, but we do it at a distance, right, from how we see our, our evangelical work, our evangelization work in the parish and the diocesan level. Um, and meeting those, we often find that those evangelical churches are doing it, right, they're, doing, they're meeting human needs at the parish level, right, not at a distance, at a charity. Right? I'll give you a third answer, welcoming. The three steps for full integration in a parish community is first step is welcoming the person, second one is making them feel like they belong, and the third one is shared ownership. I think they're doing a great job in the first step, which is welcoming. Another question. Hi, I'm Teresa from the Diocese of Venice. I work at the Parish St. Peter the Apostle. And I have a question regarding how to engage my Latino Hispanic community in parish ministry when we are not supposed to use the Spanish language. We're supposed to use one language and it's supposed to be English. And I have full-time parish ministers. I have two actually who are Spanish speaking and can amply you know, carry out the gospel and have the knowledge. But when it comes to programming, it has to be in English. We have one language. Thank you. That was my life for eight years. DRE, only English, and most children were Hispanic. And I'll tell you how. It's not the language, it's what cultural icons, food, music, prayer, style, you're putting into your evangelization information program. That's a huge one. And also the, the meetings with parents. I mean, the meetings with parents were in Spanish. The pastor didn't tell us to do just in English. So the children are speaking English. The parents, most of them are not fluent in English. So invite them, like Darius was saying, into something that speaks to their culture, to their language. But the children, and most of the publishers in the United States, as far as children and youth, have not only translated the books into Spanish, they have already put the Mexican, Latino American, South American saints in there. So I think that's what we need to do, follow that model. That's one of the answers. A final question. All right, Juan Pablo. You take that one. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Right. Just throw it out here. I, I really appreciate the conversation around um, some of the things that came out from what you've presented in terms of even the judging. One of the things that really struck me was how you saw um, this this in the, in the in the book written by Dr. Ospino as as a whole other story or a whole separate reality. I mean, my question, I guess my question is, um, how can we begin to 
dismantle some of these presidencies um, from, your, from your own perspective, from your own experience, I think there is, there is a very much a willingness uh, and a desire, as Darius was, was, was saying, and as some of the other panels were saying, of, not, of Latinos not just seeing, especially young adult Latinos in Pastoral Juvenil, of not just seeing the church as something that's going to be beneficial to them, but, but really to consciously look at, this is a greater world, it's a greater country, it's a, it's a greater community, uh, and w whatever we do to service others, as well as ourselves, at the end of the day, it's a win-win. But I guess in, 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 in your own personal opinion, how can we begin to, to it's, it's gonna be a challenge, and I know it's complex because of, of, of many, many, many factors that go into it, but how would you suggest a possible initiation to begin to dismantle some of that? Um, this is a whole other story, or this is a whole other reality that doesn't necessarily count into the reality that we want to prioritize or look at. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, thank you. And I, I mean, I get what you're saying in terms of the other part of, the other half of the story, I think, or the other part of the story. But I mean, I think that it just starts with acknowledging that, you know, what I think is so convicting about that story that Hoffman shares, right, is that, it just, you have to just point it out. I, I think it just starts there. Um, Bishop Caggiano earlier today was talking about being bold and telling the truth and um, telling the good, the bad, and the ugly. And I think that's where, you know, when we break this stuff down, you have to say, well, that's pretty ugly. And it's also something that was a blind spot, right? I mean, this is the greatest sins are usually those things that we don't even see. Right? Um, it's not the things that we're focused on, but it's those things we don't even know we're missing. And I think that's what's so convicting about that story, right? Is that it's, he didn't even know what he was saying. Um, and so that's the kind of, pre it's not just the, the prejudice of, I know what I'm saying, um, and I have some kind of anger, or I have some kind of hurt that I need to work through. But the harder stuff to work through, where we really need to do the work, is we, when we don't even know what we're, what we're looking at or what we're saying or, and how, how that affects what's going on in our relationships with each other. And I just want to say, we have to name those things as well. Um, the most recent pastoral letter from the USCCB was what? Racism. And so we have to be able to acknowledge what those systemic issues are whether it's prejudices, whether it's racism, if we don't name them and we don't claim them as part of the reality of who we are as a people in this cultural context, in this country, but also within our own church, we will never be able to begin to move past them. And so I think part of our pastoral responsibility, especially working with young adults, is to name those issues because they are realities that we are experiencing and living in today. Because when we ignore them, we lose all credibility. Young adults will no longer want to be part of a community or church that is disconnected from the social discourse, that is disconnected from the, the realities and issues that we see in the news and in our politics. So we have to name those things and say, who are we called to be as people of God to address those needs? There will be a lot of conversations and a lot of resources on this most recent letter that comes out. We need to engage in those conversations. I think if young adults are gonna take anything we say seriously as a church, especially anything that comes from our bishops right now, it needs to be through that dialogue. And I'd say uh, it needs to also begin by examining our conscience and how am I responding? How am I living my vocation as a missionary disciple? Do I really understand this as a challenge that comes out of the gospel? This is not something to be politically correct. This has nothing to do with politics. This has to do with my living the gospel of Jesus Christ going back to Pentecost. And the life of the church is like that from the beginning. Yeah. And just, uh, I wanna go back, it's that, that question up there, the second question, right, which you said was where the online chatter um, went to, is what are your personal commitments here in the room you know, for going down the mountain from Encuentro? Um, all the news stories will say, oh, it's over, it was great, but it's only halfway over. 
that's only halfway over. And so we also noticed when we asked the question, how many of you have been involved? Nobody over in the parish side of the room raised their hand. And I think that's really important for the people over in this side of the room, the diocesan directors, to recognize that the people on this side of the room at the parishes, none of them were involved so far, right? So even if the, there's great work going on at the regional level or there's great work going on at the diocesan level, if it's not making its way down to the parish level, the system's not working yet. So what are you going to do personally? And if you haven't been involved, make yourself involved. If you say, oh, my, the Hispanic director didn't invite me. It's not their job to invite you. It's your job to get involved. Um, go make yourself get involved, whether it's at the parish level, you all belong to a parish, at the parish level, the diocesan level, or the regional level as we go to back down the mountain. Well, thank you so much, and we hope that we can continue working together as we implement <coughs> the Fifth National Encuentro.